I'd like to dwell on the psychometric tests a bit longer before we get more deep into the neurobiology, because I'm guessing that many of our listeners, including myself, have never taken an IQ test before, even though we might have taken standardized tests, which I understand are uh, importantly related to IQ tests. But what do the most cutting edge psychometric tests look like? And I, I'm particularly curious about this because I wonder how they can be formulated so as not to depend on the educational background of the person who's taking them. So how can you measure somebody's verbal IQ if they never learned how to read properly or their mathematical IQ or their quantitative IQ if they didn't take calculus in college, something like this? Well, those things are not unrelated. So who takes calculus? Smarter kids in high school. Uh, so I think the simple answer to your question, I, I've described IQ tests in chapter one of, of my book just for this reason. But in some ways, the content of the items doesn't matter. This is a little tricky concept for people to get their heads around. The content doesn't matter for the G factor. So the two subtests on the WACE intelligence test, the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale, a very widely used test with subtests. The two subtests that have the highest G loading are block design, and you copy a design using blocks that are half white and half uh, red, and vocabulary. Now, vocabulary would seem to be dependent on education, but people who get who attain the highest vocabulary scores are also the people who could be more verbally attuned. In other words, have more verbal intelligence. So in some ways, it's a chicken and egg thing. But you can do, and there are many, many studies like this, where you can take psychometric IQ scores, correlate them to something controlling for education, controlling for social economic status. And when you take out any variance that's attributable to education or social economic status, you still get very robust correlations with the residual latent G factor. Now, it's maybe a slightly technical answer. Uh, but the point I want to make is because the G factor works irrespective of content, it's general to all of these tests, a particular item on a test doesn't matter. You know, uh, one of the be one of the highest loaded loaded G tests uh, was uh, uh, an analogies test. You know, wing is to bird as window is to house, or something like that. But it also uh, seemed to be the most biased. <laughs> Uh, and so the makers of the SAT test took out the analogies test, even though it was a high G, G test. Uh, so there are a lot of aspects to testing now. Uh, you can make an argument that some of the standardized tests like the SAT are not as G-loaded as they used to be because it was the G-loaded test that tended to show the largest average group differences. Um, you've said G-loaded a number of times. Does G-loaded just mean correlates to G-factor? Yes. Not every test correlates to a G-factor equally well. Uh, so yes, you can. And the G-loading uh, of tests is important. So there is a test of matrix reasoning called the Raven's Progressive Matrices Test. That is a test with a high G loading. And often researchers will only use that test in a study because it only takes 40 minutes and it can be uh, uh, given in a group setting. But it's only one score. It's much better to have G derived from a battery of tests, even though 
uh, Ravens is a, has a high G loading. And I mentioned vocabulary has a high G loading. Block design has a high G loading. Um, so uh, the assessment uh, of intelligence is really very sophisticated now. But at best, you're going to get a, 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 um, a measure. You're going to get a rank order. Uh, so if you score around 130, you're going to be in about the top 2% uh, of the population. These are statistical probabilities based on the normal distribution. IQ scores are generally normally distributed. So for the purpose of IQ testing, the scores are generally normally distributed. So most people will score 100. And, uh, and then one standard deviation would be uh, uh, 115. So between 85 and 115, you got about 64% of the population. Those are normal scores. But uh, you know, in any individual case, you have to interpret an IQ score in the context of other aspects of the person. That, that's not controversial. And saying that somebody is in the top 2% of intellectual ability in the population tells you some important information, but it's by no means tell, tells you everything you need to know about the person if you're selecting students or if you're selecting for various jobs. There are other aspects here, although uh, the G factor is predictive of many things. Uh, and the more complex the thing is you're trying to measure, uh, the more the G factor uh, helps you. So um, w one point I want to make is based on the normal distribution of IQ scores, in the United States, there are 16% uh, six, of the population would have an IQ score under 85. Now, that's 53 million people, including about 14 million children, have IQ scores below 85. Now, that's not a retardation. That's not a developmental disability. But uh, people with IQ scores in the 85 range uh, have trouble doing complex work, whether it's in college or whether it's uh, in uh, vocational work. Uh, and therefore, you got 53 million people who, through no fault of their own, I should add, uh, have difficulty navigating the complexities of everyday life in the modern world. Uh, and this, how that should impact social policy, in my view, is, is an important question. Mm -hmm. The reason that I asked about controlling for educational background is that there are a lot of misconceptions about IQ tests and other standardized tests. And the one I was uh, alluding to is that it is that IQ tests don't test intelligence, but how closely your thinking matches that of the ideal, rich, educated white man. And I'm wondering what you think of or what you think are some of the other most prominent or even destructive misconceptions about I don't spend any time on that I mean that that is a pervasive thought it's not a it's not a finding there's no empirical finding that supports that data as a matter of fact uh, there are papers that show you can extract a G factor in uh, over a hundred I think over 130 countries were studied and uh, you get G factors everywhere. It's very per pervasive. Uh, so people have these ideas, but always the question should be, the burden of proof is on them to show some study that supports that idea. The idea of these kinds of biases has been around for 50 years. These are not new arguments. And back in the 60s and the 70s, during really intense controversy about these issues, many researchers tried to generate data to test these ideas. And as far as I know, uh, no, there are no studies that support these ideas. 
Now, I, I'll you know, if people want to email me references, I'm happy to look at them. I, I, you know, I don't know everything in the in the literature, but I think critics also have to understand a concept called the weight of evidence. So they may be able to find one study here or there that suggests something like that, but the weight of evidence is that the dozens of studies that failed to find that. In the 70s, there was, there was a, an earnest effort to develop a different kind of IQ test that would be culture-free. And um, some people developed what they thought would be uh, either culture-free or that actually would favor some minority groups just to demonstrate that the content of the test is important. The problem is you couldn't extract a G factor. And with no G factor in the test, they didn't predict anything. Yeah, they would. people had different scores, but they literally were meaningless in terms of being able to predict things. So uh, there are still people around today who fervently believe things like you just said. 